how to generate a GraphQL server. Um, specifically with GQL Gen, which is a project that we are sponsoring here at 99 Designs. Um, my name's Matt, I'm an engineer here at 99 Designs. And uh, anyone that needs Wi-Fi, uh, there's a the password for our guest Wi-Fi. Uh, anyone working along on uh, with the workshop, uh, pull up this Git repo. Uh, it's got all the material that we're going to go through here, as well as some sample code that you'll need as well. Yeah, cool. If anyone needs, it will look for seating. Yep, I think we're good. There's a couple of seats down here if anyone needs. Alright, how are we going? Alright, so for this workshop you will want a, uh, a Go install. Um, Go 1.8 plus for this. Uh, everyone good for the password? Yep. Gonna jump forward. Um, you want to go point one point eight. You want to go path set up as well. Um, you will also want the binary uh, the bin folder in your path so that you can run uh, the GQL Gen bin. Um, if you don't, it's probably going to be at uh, at your home directory slash go. Um, and we're also kind of assuming for this that you've got Go format uh, running on save so that you'll get imports and stuff like that. Uh, if you installed GQL Gen previously, you might have some issues with this, but. Um, hopefully, this, we'll get through this. Um, obviously, we've got a lot of different laptops here. People have got different configurations, things like that. So, live demos uh, can go wrong. This is like times that by 20 or something. Um, so, if you do have any issues, um, save it to the end. We'll be able to help you. But alternatively, if you go to the uh, repo and submit an issue to the GQL Gen workshop uh, repo, uh, I'll do my best to sort of follow up with that and make sure everybody can get through the workshop if you've got any issues during the during the presentation. So first things first, um, we want to make a directory um, in your GoPath for this project. Uh, you can call it whatever you want, just GQL Gen Workshop is probably a good way to name this. Um, jump into there and then you want to grab these dependencies down the bottom here. So the, again, this is all in the GitHub repo, the GQL Gems dash workshop repo. So I would recommend everybody copy paste as much as possible to avoid random typos and things like that from interrupting. Um, but these dependencies might take a little while to pull down. So if everybody just gets that started and then we'll uh, go on with the rest of the workshop. All right, so what is GraphQL? Um, Maybe just by a show of hands, who is familiar with the core concept of GraphQL? All right, so a few people. Um, anyone deployed GraphQL to production? Okay, a few less people. And anyone used GQL Gen before? All right, Adam the creator has put his hand up for the record. Um, what is GraphQL? So, all right, I, I think about 50% of the audience probably put their hands up here. So. Let's run through some of the basic concepts. I'm not going to go super deep here because we're going to go through this workshop and I think you'll get a really good sense of uh, what this is as we progress. Um, but at the core level, uh, GraphQL is a query language for an API. Um, that's the name, Graph Query Language. And so it's also a runtime for fulfilling those queries. And so you have these uh, queries that you're providing to your API endpoint. And then you're going to go through these, these queries and uh, resolve them and return some data. And the great part about GraphQL is you can ask the endpoint for exactly what you want. You're not like a, dealing with a REST endpoint where you're just getting back a fixed set of data. Instead, you can sort of specify exactly the little bits of data, the data requirements that you have for your front end, and you can send that through to the back end and get exactly what you need. But as well as that, it's a schema and a type system. And so the way that a GraphQL endpoint ensures that you're only asking for things that it can provide is by having a schema. And that schema defines what that graph looks like and it has types. And we'll see that as we get further into the workshop. So how does this compare to REST? Um, that's a, a, another, um, another way to sort of commonly uh, request data from a server. Um, and a lot of people are sort of looking at GraphQL as a way to replace REST. And I don't think it's the best way to look at it, but I think it does overlap in a lot of the use cases you might have. Um, so the great part of GraphQL is you can request multiple resources in a single query. 
So instead of like having to do a request to a user's endpoint and a request to some other endpoint to get some data related to those users, you can often sort of get a lot of the data that you need for something that you want to do in a single query. Uh, and the great part about this is it reduces overfetching. So instead of getting every single detail about a user from a REST endpoint, we're kind of specifying just the bits that we want, uh, which are baked into these queries. And the other great part about this is that uh, GraphQL is self-documenting. So as part of the spec, you need to provide introspection on your endpoint. Uh, and this means that you need to be able to tell uh, a client exactly what your, cap your endpoint is capable of providing uh, in terms of data. So we've done REST a lot here at 99 for the last, uh, well, a long time now. Um, and a lot of these issues we sort of ran into, right? We're, we're writing these front ends and we're sort of communicating with our back ends and we're sort of, you know, it's, it's difficult. The cost of change is high because when we want to change the data requirements on the front end, it requires changing on the back end as well so that we're getting new shapes of data through. And you get all sorts of issues where you have multiple clients fetching the same data but having different data requirements. So GraphQL addresses a lot of these issues. And so we came up with GQL Gen. Uh, this is Adam sitting over here at the moment. Um, and he built uh, GQL Gen in basically a couple of weekends. Uh, looking around, we sort of thought that Go wasn't doing GraphQL the way we think it should. Um, there are a few libraries out there, but the trade-offs weren't great. So we have this uh, GraphQL-Go. It has a DSL, it was easy to break and hard to read. We had uh, the Gophers GraphQL Go, which is very verbose, lots of boilerplate, namespace collisions. And there was a general lack of features supporting the spec, the GraphQL specification, um, in all the available libraries. So Adam thought he could do better. And uh, what we really want to do is sort of play to the strengths of Go, right? We want type safety without having to write heaps and heaps of boilerplate. We want a good developer experience and we want a fast runtime. And so we thought generated code is the best way to do this, right? Um, so what are we going to build today? We are going to build a GraphQL endpoint. And it's going to expose a database, like a local database that we have. And it's, that's just going to be a mock database that we provided to you. We are going to hit a movie API. Uh, so it's going to be an external service. And we are going to combine both services into a single graph and let users like movies. And so this graph could be the starting point of some sort of like movie application or something like that, but it's going to illustrate, I think, some of the power that GraphQL has, right? We can specify our data requirements, we can take multiple services on the back end and go and stitch them together and present like a unified front end to the, the users. Um, and it, yeah, so that's what we're going to build today. Uh, this is what the schema is going to look like in the end. So this is a GraphQL schema. And here you can see we've got the root of our query. So GraphQL endpoints are graphs exactly what it's, it's, it's in the name. And the way that you used to traverse these graphs is through this schema. It provides you documentation on how this graph works. So in our example, we're going to have a type query, which is the root of our graph. We're going to expose users on our graph uh, and allow you to specify which user you want by ID. We're also going to expose movies on our graph uh, and let you search for movies by string and get back a, a list of movies. Uh, we're going to get uh, you've got the user, so you can see how these map to the user type, which is a pretty, pretty simple user type. It has a, a name and some ID, um, as well as a set of likes, movies that they like, um, some basic movie entities that we're going to pull from our uh, service. And down the bottom, you can see mutation. So mutations are how GraphQL lets you do, uh, like, make changes on the server. So by default, GraphQL is meant to be a query language, but it has, also has the mutation side, where we can actually edit things on the server. That's a great point. So is there a way to, easy way to generate a schema? Depending on what library you use, you might be able to generate a schema, but we actually think the schema is the best way to um, present a GraphQL interface. So this is what we want you to start with. Instead of getting the schema from some sort of DSL that you've put together, we think that the best way to do this is to start with the schema. You know, GraphQL already has a really strong type system. And then use a tool, GQL Gen, to map those types through to, to Go. All right, so for the purposes of this, we're going to imagine that we have a database. Um, we're going to have a, a, a user struct that has an ID and a name. So this could be any sort of local database you might have. 
Um, and this is in the DB package that you can see here. And it also exposes a way to get users out of the database. Um, so we want to provide, we want to sort of put this onto our graph. So the first thing we're going to do in our empty directory is we're going to make a schema file. Um, we're going to make a schema.graphql file and we're going to specify a root node and that node is going to expose users by ID. Um, and that user is going to expose an ID and a string. So I'll just go through a couple of features of GraphQL schemes here. You can see this exclamation marks around. So GraphQL, in GraphQL, every field is nullable by default. And this is something that's intentional on Facebook's part. They, when they sort of were coming up with GraphQL, they wanted it to be fault tolerant. They wanted it to be able to, by default, uh, everything is nullable. Um, and so you have to kind of opt into non-nullability. So often it makes sense to opt in uh, when you've got things that you are always going to have. Like for instance, if we resolve the user, we're always going to have an ID and we're always going to have a name. Um, but you see on the base query, user is nullable because if we provide an ID that doesn't exist, then we might want to get a null user back. All right, so after, after we've saved our schema file, we're going to initialize graph GQL gen by running GQL gen init. Now, if you don't have GQL gen in your binary path, you'll need to run uh, your go path slash bin slash GQL gen. Um, but if you run that, your directory should look like this afterwards. So you'll see you get a bunch of files spat out afterwards. We've got our schema.graphql that we've added ourselves. Uh, we've also got a generator.go file. Now this file contains all the generated Go code that does most of the GraphQL endpoint. Uh, we have a gqlgen.yml file. That's a configuration file that we'll edit in a minute. We also have modelsgen.go, which is something we don't need to worry about yet. Uh, we'll touch on that later. And we have resolver.go. And resolver.go is where GQL Gen has spat out the interfaces that we need to implement in order to make our G uh, GraphQL server work. There's also a server directory at the end, which is a very small uh, server file that we can use to boot up the server. Sorry. OK. So hopefully most of you are able to run GQL gen init successfully. And what's it actually doing under the hood? Well, it's doing a, a lot of things. This diagram here is kind of showing overall what it's doing. It's taking your GraphQL schema and your configuration. It's taking some project source code. And it's looking at your schema and it's kind of picking it apart. It's, it's parsing it, finding the types. It's looking at the code and sort of figuring out what matches with what. Now currently we haven't told GQL gen anything. We've just said, hey, we have this schema and it has a user type, and that's, that's all it knows about so far. So what GQL Gen is going to do for you is it's going to G, uh, generate structs, like G, uh, uh, Go structs for you. And that's what that model, model.go uh, file contains at the moment. But that's not the way we really want to work. We already have a user. Like, why do we want to have another user struct when we've already got a user struct? And if we leave it as it is, then we're going to have to take our database user struct and kind of map it through to the existing one. And, that just seems kind of messy, we don't want to do that. So what we're going to do is we're going to tell GQL Gen, no, 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 don't worry about generating one for us. We've already got a user. Uh, and we just want to map that through. And so the way we're going to do this is by editing our config file. So now I want you to edit uh, gqlgen.yml. And it's a YML config. You'll see a little bit of config in there already. Uh, and just add these few lines at the end. And so what this is going to tell GQL Gen is, is for these models, for the user model, if you find a user model in the schema, map it to this go type. So if you run, so, okay, so that's, that we're telling GQL Gen, this is our user. All right, so the next thing we want to do is run GQL Gen again. And when we run it again, it's going to pick up the, chain, the, the config, figure out that, oh, okay, this user maps onto our struct, and it's going to marry the two together in the generated code. But the first thing you want to do, and make sure you do this, is remove the resolver.go file. So the resolver.go is the bit of bits of code that we're going to actually implement in order to make our GraphQL endpoint work. Currently, uh, it's got some boilerplate code in there with the, the generated uh, user type that GQL gen made for us. Uh, and we want to get rid of that, because we're going to, when we run GQL gen again, it will look and figure out that we've already got a user. 
and it will rewrite those resolvers for us. All right, so after you've removed the resolver.go file and run GQL gen uh, again, so just uh, to make a point, run GQL gen by itself without a init. A init will only work if you don't have a config file. As soon as you've got a config file, init won't run, so you just need to run the GQL gen binary by itself. And running it by itself will do its default function, which is to look at your schema, look at your config, and generate you a GraphQL endpoint. But we're at the interesting part. We get to implement our, uh, our resolver. And so we've got this user resolver, and if you look in resolver.go now, you'll see that this function will be there for you already. It'll have a single line, which is a panning, but we actually want it to do the thing that we're here to do, which is to get the users from the database and give them back to the client. So there's a little bit of code in here, and it's pretty straightforward. We're going to call user. So you see GQL Gen has sort of uh, like given us this interface already, and so it's going to give us the string argument that is coming through, um, and all it expects from us is to return a pointer to a user struct, okay? And so, very simple, we're just going to call get user ID. If we don't get a user back, we're going to return an error, but if we do, we're going to return the user. All right, so if you're still playing at home, uh, you should be able to boot the server right now. So if you run go run server dot slash server go, it should boot the server. Now, if you run into any issues, yeah. Yep, yep, so remember at the start I said if you're running uh, go format, it should pick up the, the, the dependencies that we installed at the start. Now, if you don't have that already, Let me show you. So here is the, uh, you'll see down the bottom we installed two dependencies. We installed GQL gen, which is the binary and all the, the handler and the, the runtime. Uh, and we installed the GQL gen workshop. So the GQL gen workshop is what we need for this DB code. Um, so you'll see if you open that up in, in GitHub, it's got, two, it's got two packages in there. One is the DB, which is what we want now. And the other one is a movie database that we'll look at in a minute. Um, but if you, so if you don't have Go format running, you'll need to manually import it. So add an import statement at the top of resolvers.go and just reference github.com slash 99 design slash GQL gen workslot slash db. Yeah, how's everyone else going? Cool. So. This is a little taste of the developer workflow here. So with GQL Gen, you start with the schema. You make changes to it, you run GQL Gen, and then you implement your resolvers. And then that's the loop we get into. So if you want to make a new change, you start with the schema, make the change you want, run GQL Gen, GQL Gen will give you resolvers that you can implement. Um, now GQL Gen ensures that you, can, uh, that you are implementing everything and it, will, it won't, won't run, it won't compile if you aren't implementing all the resolvers that you've specified in your schema. And so this guarantees that at least you're going to address every single part of your schema and that your, your generated uh, endpoint will, will function. What do we see when the server's running? So, great point. When the server is... Great point. Really good point. <laughs> <laughs> uh, when the server's running, if you open up localhost 8080 in a browser, you will see the... Uh, GQL, the, uh, the playground. In fact, I'm actually going to do that now. So, if I run this, you should see something like this. When we boot it, it's going to pull it up on this screen. Let me pull it across. You'll get something that looks like this. And this is the, the, the GraphQL playground. So this is awesome because uh, GQL gen ships with this. Uh, it's not, it's not our part of our project. It's a third party project. But it's a really nice little web app that lets you interact with your uh, GraphQL endpoint uh, on the spot. So you can see over here, I have. Uh, Yep, I'll try and make it a bit bigger. How's that? Yeah. 
Cool. So you can see over here I have a query. Um, and if I run this, it's not going to work until I get this syntax right. There we go. So uh, now this is this this is what a query looks like. This is our running GraphQL endpoint here. You can see what I've done in the query is I've said I want the user with ID one, and I want to get their name. And so you can see if I delete their name, it complains and it won't run because. The way the GraphQL works is you need to actually ask for fields at each of the node. You can't just ask for the user by itself. You need to specify what your data requirements are. And that's really powerful because it means that we're forced to think about what we actually want to get uh, when we run it. So there's a, there's a bunch of canned users in there already. If you, you sort of run through, you can see there's a few different users. And if you're at this point then, and it's running, then thumbs up, let's get going. Awesome. Cool. So, we've got it. we're exposing our users through the graph. The next thing we want to do is connect to an external service. And so, to the client consuming the graph, they're not going to see any difference between us connecting to a local database and us connecting to an external service. Um, for this, we've provided you again with another, another package. And it's got a, a very simple movie struct and it has a very simple, exposed as a single method that is actually going to do an uh, external call um, and return you a, a slice of movies. So, what's the first thing we do in our, in our workflow? Edit our schema. So we're going to add to our schema a new type, the type movie. Uh, it has a non-nullable ID title and year. And then we're actually going to add our movies edge to the root query. So at the top of the schema file, you should have a type query. We're going to add a new entry underneath user, and it's going to be movies. And it's going to take a single argument, which is search, which is a non-nullable string, and it will give you back a non-nullable array of movies, which is also non-nullable. So you notice the sort of non-nullableness everywhere, it's sprinkled around everywhere, and this is intentional, again. What this is saying is we want to get back an array that cannot be null, so there has to be an array there, and it has to have movies in there. So each element of the array must have a movie in it. No, no elements can be null. So we've updated the schema. The next thing we need to do is do our type mapping again. Now, if we didn't do this step, GQL Gen is going to generate us a struct, but we don't want that right now because we've already got a struct. We've already got our omdb.movie struct, and we're going to map that again in our config file. So once you've got that, once you've updated the schema, and you've got the config up, set up, run generate. It's worth noting you can run GQL Gen with dash V, and it will actually give you a breakdown of what it's doing. Um, in terms of how it's resolving the things that it thinks it needs to resolve. Uh, it might give you a little bit of insight if you're having issues at any point here. But that should, if that worked correctly, then we now can move on to the next step and implement the resolver. So here's the resolver we're going to implement. Um, now, if you look in resolver.go, you'll notice nothing's changed because GQLGen is not going to club a code that you've already put there. That's why we had to remove resolver.go in one of the earlier steps. So what we need to do is actually copy this resolver across for ourselves. You can look in generator.go and you can find that it's implemented this uh, on, on our query resolver interface. It's now added movies because it's, it's found that on the schema. And so what, it, what it's saying to us is, all right, fair enough. We've mapped movie to your struct that you've provided. So whenever somebody asks for a, 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 the movies node, we expect that you return to us a, a, an array of structs. And this is really simple because our, uh, our search interface already provides this, so we can just plug that straight in, take the search string and provide that straight to the method search, and we should get our movies back. Now, if you have followed everything uh, and it's all working for you, if you run go run server slash server dot go again, then now you can query against uh, the third party API. So let's give it a go. Right, looks good. Okay. 
and here it is. So if I go now, uh, I want movies, and I want to search for a movie, and let's search for Star Wars. Uh, now, so that's not enough for a query, I need to tell it what I want, and I want the title, and I want the year. And if I run that, I get a list of all the Star Wars movies in this database. So this is awesome, it's even got uh, Solo, so that's cool. Great, so. This is awesome, now we have a single GraphQL endpoint and it's exposing users and it's exposing these movies. So it's a local database and an external third party service. Great, what can we do with that? Well, like we said, let's implement a way to like these things. And so, likes obviously involving, involve changes on the server. We can't, we, if we like it, we need to store it somewhere. Um, so we provided this for you. If you look at the DB um, user struct, it has a likes uh, slice on it as well. And we're gonna manipulate that to sort of store what movies the user likes and give that back. Um, and so the first thing we need to do, again, back to our workflow, we're going to open up schema.graphql and we are going to add a new type. So this is a type mutation. So GraphQL has three special types. It has query, it has subscription, and it has mutation. So we've seen query. Query allows you to query data from the server. Mutation lets you change data on the server. And subscriptions we'll touch on a little bit later, but it lets you subscribe to data changes on the server. So within the mutation type, uh, we need to define all the different mutations that you can uh, perform on our server. And so we're going to add a new mutation. It's called like. It takes a user ID and it takes a movie ID and it returns you a user. So this is another interesting point of GraphQL. Uh, mutations can return, must, must return a type, uh, but they can kind of return anything you want. And so often you want to use this to return a type that's kind of whatever changed on the server so that you get that, type, you get that data back and you can update your UI or whatever you're working with um, with the changes. So if you've added that to your schema, we're going to run GQL gen again. And we're going to implement the resolver. Now there's a bit of boilerplate in this one, so I definitely suggest a copy-paste. GQL gen for us has now implement, in, uh, created a new interface, and that's called the mutation resolver. And if you look in generator.go, you should be able to find mutation resolver interface. And that interface currently just has a single method, which is like. So again, you can see all the boilerplate's gone out of this. It's all hidden in generator.go for you. And all we need to do is implement some type that, uh, that matches the mutation resolver interface. So if you take this code, let's break it down a little bit. We've created a struct here. It's going to have a pointer to a resolver because there's not actually going to be too much difference here between our base resolver uh, and our mutation resolver. Uh, there's no additional dependencies that we need. In fact, all the dependencies are provided for us in the GQR Gen workshop code. So if we look down at like, uh, you can see we get a string, which is a user ID, and a string that's a movie ID, and we're expected to return a pointer to a user. So the first thing we're going to do is get the user. If we don't have a user, that's fine. If we do have a user, we're going to call a method on user called like, and we're going to give it the movie ID, and then we're going to return the user a nil. Now all that like does, if you look at the source code, is it has a slice of IDs. It's just going to take that movie ID and append it to the slice. Very straightforward. So it's not actually even requesting the movie. And in, in a more fleshed out API, you would probably request that and at least ensure that there's a movie to be liked and return an error if you couldn't find it. Uh, but for our simple example, we're just going to append that ID and assume it exists. But the other side of that is we want to actually be able to get the likes back out of the database. Uh, now, if we just expose likes on our user type, we're going to get a array of IDs, and that's not what we want. That's not really utilizing the power of GraphQL, because GraphQL is a graph, and it means that types can, can, can have uh, edges to other types, and they can have edges to other types, and they can even have edges to their own type. Uh, and so here, what we actually want to do is we want to say, like, no, 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 I, I, I want the user. If I have a user, I want to be able to figure out all the movies that they've liked, regardless of where that user appears in the graph. So for us, we're only exposing the user through the root, but a user could be up here anywhere. For instance, a common pattern is to have a viewer or a me that sits at the root that, uh, identify, that returns data for the uh, authenticated user. Now, for our simple example, we don't have that, but you could easily imagine returning a user there as well. And so you want to be able to have that same interface everywhere, that anywhere we specify a user type, 
that we can request the same data. So if you've added uh, likes to, to the user type in our schema, um, you'll notice it's a movie slice, the same as we had on the root movie node. Um, and you rerun GQL gen, that should go. And then the next part of that again is to implement the resolver part of that. Now, GQL gen's done something clever for us in that it's sort of, it's looked at our user struct and it said, well, you don't have likes on there. Now, user, the user struct does have likes, but it's not exported. And so GQL gen can't find likes, so it's like, well, I guess uh, this doesn't match up with the struct that you've told me to, so I'm going to give you a new resolver. And this is some of the power of GQL gen, because GQL gen will actually look at the schema term and it'll look at the go type and it'll figure out how it doesn't match. And wherever it doesn't match, it will give you an opportunity to resolve to some additional data that you want. And this is great for us because this is exactly what we want to do. So you can see uh, we now have this user resolver interface, which is a new interface, uh, and it exposes likes. And likes gets a pointer to a user, which is actually coming from the, resolve, the, the user resolver. So as we go through our graph and we traverse it, we get to a point where there's a user being requested and we run the user resolver and we get back the user from the database. And then if we're requesting the likes that the user has, then GQL gen, the runtime, will go, okay, let's call the likes resolver and then let's give them the user that we found before. And then that resolver can use the user to look up and, and figure out whatever it needs to resolve in the next part. So down the bottom is the next part, the next bit of the interface we need to resolve. Uh, to implement. And you can see, again, this is a new type of uh, resolver. It's a new resolver interface. It's a user resolver. And there's a little bit of boilerplate at the top. Again, to, you could inject dependencies here. Your user resolver might need some pointer to a database connection or something like that. And that gives you an opportunity to sort of hook in dependencies there. But further down, you can see we have our likes. This is our uh, likes resolver. We get the user, and all we're going to do is call a function on the OMDB package, which is get all, and it takes an, a, an, a slice of IDs, and it will actually hit the database and return you the movies for every ID. All right. So if everything's in place and it's all working, you will now be able to start the server again and run a query. So let me do that for you. Going to run the server. Give this a refresh. Now you can see I can still query, do all the same queries that I could before. Uh, but now I can actually run this mut like mutation. Here's one I prepared earlier. Now, a, a mutation query is very similar to a, uh, a normal query and that it, it can do exactly the same sorts of things. So you recall that a like mutation will return us a user. And so within that, we can query for any fields that are on user. And within that, we can, feel, uh, we can query for any fields that are on fields that are on user. And so on, so on. And this is what makes GraphQL really powerful, is because we can go all the way down. We can have all sorts of connections, and depending on what we want to get, depending on what our data requirements are, we can get all that data in a single request. And this is a mutation request. So this is going to make a change on the server and give you back a bunch of data that has changed. So if I run this, it returns me uh, a it returns my data and it returns the user. So user one is Chris, and it says, great, Chris likes Star Wars, that's awesome. And now if I come back here and I say, all right, cool, uh, I wanna get Chris back and get the likes that he has. I don't really care about his name, I just want the likes. But that's not gonna work actually because I need more than that. I need to actually specify what I need out of the movie in order to render it. So actually I want the title and I want the year as well. And there we go. We can see Chris likes Star Wars. Awesome, so you can play around with that as much as you want now. You can search for a movie 
You can search for any movie you want. You can get the ID and you can like that. And if you request those likes back through the graph, you're going to get those likes that you want that, that you just liked. You're going to get the details of that movie. And this is all happening for us in the background. We didn't tell. We we, we weren't super explicit around about. Well, you, if you get a user, then we get the movie on the user, likes on the user, then you have to go get the movies. We implemented this as just a set of resolvers, and it's just a set of nodes. And that we've connected it all up through our schema. And GQL Gen's done the hard part of, of generating all that boilerplate for us and sort of gluing everything together. Uh, and all we, so all we need to do is just sort of specify the data that we want to provide to the client, and then implement, fill in the blanks after GQL Gen has run. All right. So that's a really brief overview of some of what GraphQL can do. GQL Gen itself has a bunch, of, um, a bunch of additional features, and we've been working on it a lot for the last couple of months. Um, we're still not at a 1.0, but we just hit 0.5 with a bunch of new features, and we're sort of on the road to 1.0 at this point. But there's all sorts of things you can do. Directors, I'm just going to sort of rapid fire a bunch of additional features that we have here without going too much into them. Uh, directives are basically a way that you can tag your schema. And so they're basically a way that you can say for this field on the schema, and you can tag things other than fields, uh, I, want to, um, I want to just let, let the GQL gen know that this has this property. And you can use that for all sorts of things, but permissions is a very common use case. So you could say, here's my user type, uh, and it has uh, some sort of super secret field on it, uh, but only admins can see that. And if you use directives, GQL Gen will generate you, again, a directive resolver. You can use that directive resolver to implement the logic that you want to run when somebody requests that field. We also have subscriptions. So GQL Gen supports subscriptions via WebSockets. Uh, and that's what it sounds like. You can subscribe to data changes on the server. Um, and GQL Gen will do the hard part of sort of like hooking all that up for you and it'll just like let you notify a channel when uh, bits of data change and that will send that back through via WebSockets to the client. So that's really powerful. Um, if you check out GQL Gen, we've got a chat example that does pretty much what it sounds like. You can boot up two instances of it and chat between them. And that's using subscriptions to give real-time uh, updates between both. Uh, data loaders, if you look at the GQL Gen docs, uh, which I'll link to in a minute, you can use data loaders. So one of the hard parts you're going to have if you're writing a GraphQL server with these resolvers is what happens if you implement a user resolver but then a client requests like 100 users. And are you going to go through and do a database query in that resolver every time, you know, all right, we're going to resolve user one, then user two, then user three. Uh, and so data loaders is a technique, I think it, becomes, it comes from Facebook as well, but it's a technique for optimizing these sort of N, N plus one queries to different services. And the way it does that is it uses Go, uh, Go routines to sort of batch up these different uh, requests and then sort of you're running your uh, resolvers, and they're all running. And I'm, I should actually mention that resolvers in uh, GQL Gen run concurrently. And so every resolver at every level will run at the same time. And so if you're requesting like a, a, you know, a bunch of users, they're all going to hit this request service at the same time. And you can use this data loader technique to batch them all up and then actually go to your external service and only ask for, only ask for those users in a single request. Uh, testing, the way we test here is we use the HTTP test package to perform queries against a running GraphQL server. So we actually boot up our server here, and it, all our tests are just doing external testing. So running, uh, we'll usually mock some of the backends and then just run actual live queries against GQL Gen. And the runtime will you know, in, in, make assertions on the results that it gives back. Uh, and a new feature that just landed is query complexity. So ob obviously one of the problems that you might have uh, with GraphQL, because you can sort of have these types point to themselves, you can therefore have unlimited nested queries to a point, right? And so how do you protect against denial of service? Well, one feature that we've just added is to uh, have query complexity. So before we actually even hit the graph, we will compute the complexity for you. Um, and you can specify that yourself. We have a default, default implementation. Um, but you can actually just like opt out of some queries as they become too complex. And usually that complexity sort of builds up as you sort of get deeper into a, a query hierarchy, but you might also have some custom complexity there to say like, well, if you ask for a thousand users, we're just going to opt out. All right, cool. Thanks for all that. Uh, hopefully that run went well for everybody. Uh, if it didn't, come to, feel free to come and see me or one of the other 99ers after the show. Um, we're actually hiring at the moment. Um, if you check out nanodesigns.com slash about slash jobs, if you're sort of interested in any of this tech that we're, we've shown today, then uh, you know, we're really interested in finding uh, GoDevs. 
Um, and if you're just interested in the GQL Gen project in general, check it out, gqlgen.com. Um, it's got links through the GitHub, and uh, yeah, we're definitely welcoming anyone that's, that's keen to contribute at this point. Thank you. Any questions? Yeah, performance. Performance, yeah. Uh, well, like I said, um, one, I mean, one of the advantages of, of actually implementing a GQL Gen Server in Go is performance. Um, you know, we have really cheap, lightweight uh, Go routines, and so one of the performance uh, things that we do is run your graph query uh, by default. Well, actually, you can't opt out. We run it in parallel, and so each uh, node on your query will run in parallel at the same time, and that, that will run to the cascade down. So each successive node will run in parallel at the same time, and so that way you can do things like data loading. You can go and sort of batch up all the different bits of data you want to collect at the same time and do it in a single request. Um, yeah, performance can be a big issue, and we've found it really. It's it's, it's been it's it's worked out really well for us. We've had. Anecdotally, just through our GitHub issues, people are saying the performance is really good. Um, but I don't think we have any benchmarks at the moment. I think it's just kind of good enough for what we're doing, and I think uh, we haven't had any complaints about it so far, yeah. Yeah? Uh, my apologies for being late. That's all right. It's been like the very first sentence of this evening's presentation. Um, the uh, Go GraphQL library that exists, uh, what, what was it that, in evaluating that um, make you decide that I'm yeah, 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 absolutely. So why did we not uh, do, just use one of the existing ones? I had a slide on that at the start, so. So yeah, we sort of, Adam built this project, I think around February, March this year. Um, and so looking at the existing ones, a lot of them did the opposite of what we wanted to do. They were sort of building up these schema, these endpoints, and sort of they give you a schema at the end. And we kind of thought that's not that's not how we wanted to do it because we've sort of got we've already got a type system with GraphQL and that's the schema file and so why don't we take the schema file and like use that to bind to our Go types? So that's what we that's that's one of the reasons. There's a bunch of other reasons as well though, right? So some of the existing libraries would do that schema last kind of approach. Um, some of them are very verbose and they require a lot of boilerplate in order to ensure type safety. And so that's one of the things we want to avoid as well. We want type safety throughout, but we don't want to have to you know, be writing and casting back and forth and doing all these sorts of things all the time. Um, and so we thought the generator approach was the best way to do that. And that was to yeah, have, have some, sort of run time, uh, some, some sort of binary that will run inspect your schema and spit you out just like some, some, um, bl some resolvers that you can fill in the blanks for. Wasn't, wasn't the GraphQL one broken for quite some time? Being <laughs> I'm not sure. Yeah, I think that's probably one of the other things we're looking at is just the general lack of features. Like uh, the GraphQL spec is evolving. If you go to the, if you pull up the GraphQL spec, it's got its version sort of every few months or so. And so there's a lot of things that we wanted that weren't there yet. Um, directives were one of them. Um, yeah, and we, we've implemented a lot of features around that we're sort of trying to keep up with the spec as it's evolving. Yeah, sorry. Um, It might be actually, yeah. Sorry, it might be a typo. Yeah. How about like a Yeah, good question. Um, don't know. Yeah, we haven't figured out how to do that either. Uh, it's something we'd like to look at, I think, as particularly as we're rolling out GraphQL wider across the platform. Um, but yeah, I don't think anyone really has great ideas about how to do it yet. There's kind of some include type stuff in, in sort of that isn't part of the spec yet that's kind of in flux. There's a few different approaches like that. Um, I mean, we think that, like, at the very least, GQL Gen opens you up to not stitching, stitching schemas together, but at least stitching services together, right? So you've got that single service, uh, schema, and behind the scenes, you can be stitching as many services as you want. I think in our production GQL, uh, uh, GraphQL endpoint, we must stitch at least four or five services together uh, and expose that, so. Down. Anyone else? Yeah? You mentioned that I was very good. Yeah. 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 It's hard to do. Um, so th there's a different bunch of different approaches you could do. Um, so I was talking about directives. I think is probably what you were picking up on. So directives are one way that you can tag different parts of your schema. So if we were to look at the final schema here, what I could actually say was, say, um, you know, the year that a movie came out was a protected field for some reason. Uh, I could actually de uh, annotate that with a de with a declaration to say like, oh, this is for admins only. 
And when you run GQRGen, it's going to give you a new resolver that you can implement the logic for whatever admin only needs to be. That's one way you could do it. That's a very general approach. But uh, in terms of like more generically, yeah, I mean, you're going to have to write the resolvers to only uh, return the things that you, that you think the current user should be able to, to return. You could put it wherever you want, but yeah, I mean, a, a common place we do it at the moment is usually in resolvers. Um, but with this directly feature that landed about a month ago, that, that's another avenue you could use to, to get that in place. Yeah. Have you found resolvers sort of get out of hand at all? Can they abuse them at all? Uh, we, not really. We, we found, I mean, GQRGen is pretty flexible in terms of how you structure your resolvers, right? So you saw, even in our very simple example, you got like a different resolver interface for each kind of level of the, um, of the graph as we move through. And you can take those and sort of put them around wherever you want. Um, I think in our experience, no, we found it pretty, a pretty good way to approach resolving a graph at the moment. Uh, I can't think of any major issues we've, we've come across. Is there anything specific you were thinking? Oh, no, I'm just, I'm just trying to digest it all. Yeah, cool. Try yeah. to figure out where my sort of underlying queries are going. Yeah, I, I, like we don't have a huge graph here. Though. I mean, it's it's still like like I said, stitching a bunch of different services together. It's probably got you know maybe twenty different entities in it. Um, but even that, we we still found there's enough complexity in there that we've needed to break it up over several packages and sort of have some some natural separation that's formed there. And it did start out as a single resolver, resolver.go, but we sort of you know pulled it apart and, 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 and gradually grew it, so it was a, a more natural sort of uh, laying out of the code. Yeah. yeah. Have, you, have you found like is there any particular uh, backends that, that work better or? I mean, we're completely backend agnostic yeah, sure. in terms of what you're actually connecting to. Uh, we, we have got sort of plans vaguely to um, ship directives that will allow you to sort of stitch in REST and gRPC sort of endpoints into your, your server. Um, we're sort of looking at a plugin architecture that we maybe we could land, uh, but there's a lot of complexities there in terms of how that actually, how, what, what you expose to these plugins to let you edit the, the schema on the way through GQL Gen. Um, but yeah, it's definitely something we're thinking about, yeah. Sorry, you had a question? Yeah, just on the resolver one, complexity. I mean, have you considered even looking at CRQFS for um, busting everything up and making it all nice and clean? Yep. Um, in terms of complexity, uh, I mean, the complexity is something that the, uh, the, the generated code will give you by default. Yeah. Um, I mean, uh, GraphQL kind of naturally gives you this uh, as what you're talking about, right, by giving you this sort of query uh, interface and this mutations interface. So there's kind of, you're not expected to make any changes on the server as you're running queries. They should be sort of independent to, to a certain degree. Um, but yeah, in terms of complexity, it's kind of a, it's a separate issue, right? It's kind of trying to protect you from denial of service and things like that. So, yeah. Yeah, cool. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we're already already be using it in production. We have since uh, about April, I think, when we launched uh, as a new service using this. Um, yeah, there's, we're definitely picking up in terms of uh, community support and people contributing to it, and, and definitely would welcome contributions from anyone here tonight. Um, in terms of all the materials for this are available online. Um, I linked it in the meetup uh, comments, so if anyone's sort of missing that, I'll put that up again, actually. So all the workshop material from tonight is up here uh, on GQ Gen Workshop. Um, but yeah, in terms of support for the core library itself, yeah, look, look, it's something we've adopted wholeheartedly here. Um, you know, we've had multiple developers doing multiple sprints on this, um, and yeah, it's something we want to support because we think this is the best way to do G uh, GraphQL in Go. Cool. All right. All right. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>